the book of 1 Kings, the first book of Kings, chapter 17, reading from verse 1 to 7. 17, chapter of the first book of Kings, 1 to 7. It is found in the Pew Bibles on page 299. Elijah predicts a drought. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. This is God's word. Thanks. So if you keep your Bibles open to 1 Kings uh, chapter 17, begin a series of messages on the life of Elijah. And I want to orient you hopefully in a fun way, to the history here. And I, every time I get to preach, and I, I sometimes do this, but I'm going to give you uh, about 520 years of Israel's history. You're all going to do this together, and you're going to do the motions that I do, or I will call you out. All right? So in the first period of the monarchy for the nation of Israel, which was, it was God's people, Israel, there was something called the United Kingdom. So here's what you've got to do. United Kingdom. Say it after me. United Kingdom. And it was 120 years long. So go 120 years. Most of you are doing this. Okay? Say it after me. United Kingdom. 120 years. Okay? And there were three kings during this period. The first king was Saul. You're going to crown yourself. Saul, no heart. Okay? David, okay, we're having trouble here. You can say it after me, okay? David, whole heart. Solomon, half heart. Not bad. Now let's do it together. I think you've got it. Ready? I got it? Together, we're going to do this. United Kingdom, 120 years. Saul, no heart. David, whole heart. Solomon, half heart. And after Solomon, Solomon's son Rehoboam comes along and he taxes the people and is uh, not, uh, not wise in the way he exercises his rule over the nation Israel. And so the nation splits into two. All right? So now we're going to say this after me. Divided kingdom. kingdom. And you got to make your little thing longer. 400 years. years. All right, not bad. Now, it divided between the north and the south. The northern kingdom was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. There were 19 kings in in the northern kingdom. There There were 20 kings in the southern kingdom, Judah. None of the kings in the north in Israel were good, only eight of the 20 kings were good uh, in the southern kingdom, Judah. So here's what we're going to do. You can say it after me. North, North. south, South. Israel, Israel. Judah, Judah. 19, 19. 20, 20. 20. 0, 0. 8. Prophets speak, shape up, up. or ship ship out. Not bad. Let's see if you can all do this together. Right, the whole thing. You're smart, you can do this. We're going to start at the very beginning here. 
United Kingdom, 120 years. Saul, no heart. David, whole heart. Solomon, half heart. 400 years. North, South, Israel, Judah, 19, 20, 0, 8. Prophets speak, shape up, or ship out. It's about for the a good, very nice job, very nice job. Let's bow for the benediction. <laughs> what I think is really important about Elijah is that Elijah is in the northern kingdom. He's in the, the north there. And the nation, the northern kingdom, is in spiritual freefall. If you go back this afternoon and read uh, 1 Kings 16, you'll find that Omri, who was the sixth king of Israel in the northern kingdom, did more evil than any of the other previous kings. You see that in 1 Kings 16, 25. After Omri, there's a man named Ahab becomes king in Israel. And in 1 Kings 16, 30, it says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. So the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, slips further down spiritually. We then read that the spiritual decline in in Israel degenerates even further. Take a look at verse 31 of 1 Kings, where it says, And as if it it had been, excuse me, and as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, this is talking about Ahab, He took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all of the kings of Israel who were before him. It was a spiritual wasteland. Essentially, what should have been a nation that was designed by God and called by God to show the world the beauty and glory of God is now this this kingdom that uh, they they may have some worship of Yahweh, yes, but they are also worshiping Baal and the Asherah. God's people, unwilling, in some sense almost unable to worship God, God alone. And the nation, God's people, are in spiritual darkness that is profound. And what happens is God raises up this guy called Elijah the Tishbite in Gilead. Uh, Elijah sort of comes out of nowhere. It doesn't appear that his his, his family is necessarily powerful at all. It seems like he comes from a very rugged area of Israel, sort of a mountain man kind of a person, comes out of nowhere and confronts Ahab, the king of Israel. And what I think we learn when we we, we look at the the life of Elijah, I think we can learn some very important lessons on how we should respond to our situation, the culture that we live in that is filled with confusion and darkness. And there are principles that we can learn from Elijah to help shape how we respond to a world that by and large has moved away from the worship of God himself. So this morning, I want us to learn two uh, very important lessons that should mark us. They marked Elijah. And let's look at the first lesson. We see in verse 1, Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now you look at that and you say, wow, Elijah comes out of nowhere, comes right to the king Ahab, this wicked king who's leading 
God's people into idolatry and basically says, until I say so, there's not going to be any rain here. Now, I suspect that um, while, while we may be concerned with the spiritual condition of New Jersey, I suspect that not many of you will join me tomorrow when I go to the governor and tell him there will neither be rain or dew except at my word. I don't think that's the way we would apply the text, but this is what Elijah does. And what's interesting, we've already read this, but I want you to turn to James 5. Madhu read this earlier. But in the New Testament, we're told a little bit more information about what Elijah actually did. Verse 17, it said, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Verse 17 of James 5. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, why in the world was Elijah prompted to pray this particular prayer? What would lead him to believe that this would be an appropriate prayer? And for that, we need to turn to Deuteronomy 11. Because Elijah was not just making something up. Elijah was essentially praying the word of God over the nation of Israel, over God's people. So he looks to this uh, passage in, in Deuteronomy 11. So let me look at the positive in verse 8. He says, you shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and take possession of the land. This was words of God given to the nation of Israel before they went into the promised land. Verse 9, and that you may live long in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and to their offspring, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land that you are entering to take possession of is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated it like a garden of vegetables. But the land you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water by the rain from heaven, a land that the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it. From the beginning of the year to the end. He goes on to say, and if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the, and the, and the later rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. He goes on to say that if the people of God, Israel, will obey him, this land will be fruitful and God will provide rain so that there can be crops and so that their livestock can be cared for. Within the negative, verse 16, take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain and the land will yield no fruit and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. When Elijah goes in to see King Ahab and tells him there's not going to be any rain and, and, until I, I say so, what, 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 and we see from James 5, what, what Elijah is simply doing, he is praying the word of God over the situation appropriately. He's taking God's word, and he's asking that the word of God given to the nation of Israel should be fulfilled, should be effectuated in that land. In other words, since the people had, are now following after Baal, following after false gods, He's asking that God enact his promises, the promises of bringing discipline to God's people through no rain. And so the first sort of activity that we see that Elijah does that I think we should mirror in our own life is praying the word of God on our situation, in our church and in our country and for the world. When Elijah looks at his nation, which is supposed to be a nation to display the beauty and glory of God, and sees that they are worshiping these false gods, he takes God's word from Deuteronomy 11 and prays it 
and ask God to make what God said he would do to God's people to happen. Now, I do think we need to be careful here. America is not in the same position as Israel was. We are not God's chosen people in the same way that Israel was. God chose Israel. God chose this nation specifically. We are a nation like any other nation. And certainly God is concerned with what happens in our nation, but I'm not sure Deuteronomy 11 is what we need to pray for our country in spite of its problems. But there are many other texts in God's word that would be appropriate for us to pray. And my concern for each of us I'm concerned for myself, is that when I look at what's happening in the world and what it it looks like when when I read about what's happening even in our own country, I I tend to get sort of uh, like, wow, this uh, this is not good. I can get somewhat depressed. I'm very depressed because my children blame my generation for all the problems in the country. Dad, it's your fault and your friends. But Elijah's example would show us that we are not hopeless, we are not helpless, there is something we can do, and that is to pray. And specifically, to pray God's word on us as a church, but also for our country and for the world, to pray the word of God appropriately in its right context so that God would effectuate his word in our midst, not only for our good, but for his glory. I'll give you a great example of this on a prayer call this week. We have a prayer meeting every Tuesday night. Love for some of you to join that if you can. We do it on Zoom. And we were praying for the country of Haiti. And we had uh, three uh, of our global partners that we've worked with. Mark and Ann Bradley, who are in the States, but have been in Haiti. They can't be in Haiti right now. We talked to Pastor Valentine, who was in Haiti at the time. We also talked to, to, to Jean Toussaint, who's also in Haiti, who we support, who teaches at a seminary, pastors there. And they were giving us a report on what was happening on the ground in Haiti. None of that report was good. Total disaster and anarchy. They fear for their safety. They fear for the safety of their family members. The, the, the country is completely broken. Food and, and supplies can't get what they are needed. There's anarchy on the streets. Nobody feels safe. And, uh, you know, honestly, it was, it, it was, it was terribly discouraging. And particularly when you think of uh, how many uh, of, of, of our fellow believers here at Stone Hill are from Haiti. And uh, they've told me multiple times over the last months, they do not want to get a phone call at night because they are fearful. It's more bad news from one of their relatives in Haiti who is suffering or died or been killed or missing. And so it was very difficult after all of these reports were given and we were going to pray for Haiti. It was like, what, what, what can we pray for? What in the world can we pray for? And one of the first people who prayed basically said, Lord, I don't even know what to pray. And they just prayed that God would somehow pr- provide protection and intervene, which was the, the right thing. But I think we were all struggling to know what to pray for. There was a very long pause on the prayer call. Nobody wanted to pray second because we were just... We were overwhelmed with the need, and what in the world do we pray for? And then one of the members on that prayer call simply prayed this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Somehow, Lord God, may your reputation be deepened and extended in Haiti. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, You know this displeases you. This is not how heaven runs. We need the will of heaven to to rain down on on leaders in the whole country to bring the order that you would want for the people of Haiti. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread. They pray for people of Haiti just simply to have food, medicine, basic supplies to live 
prayed against uh, temptation and, and, and the evil one who brings temptation and then finishes up the Lord's Prayer by acknowledging that God had the power and the authority to act on behalf of the people of Haiti. And that's exactly right. That is a application of what Elijah did for the nation Israel, but praying, simply praying the Lord's Prayer for any situation you are struggling with, any situation you're burdened with in our country and the world, tremendously important. Very appropriate and important. And I think if we're honest, it's very easy for us when we read the news, we, 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 we get worried, we get upset. And then what do we do? We talk about it with other people who are also upset. And we talk about it and we sort of, you know, oh my, well, this is terrible. And oh, it's worse today than it was yesterday. And we can spend most of our time talking about the problems instead of talking to the one person who has the power to deal with the problems, which was God himself. Other ideas for you in your prayer in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3, there's a prayer that Paul prays for the believers in Ephesus. Great prayer to pray for us as a church. To pray Ephesians 1 or pray Ephesians 3 over us. To take God's word and apply it to the situation. To pray for us as God's people today, the church. That God would take his word and make it happen. This is what Elijah does. Back to 1 Kings chapter 17. Elijah, meditating on Deuteronomy 11, has begun praying that God's word will be fulfilled in the northern kingdom of Israel. And he's so confident that God will fulfill his word as he prays. He goes right to the king. And says, there's never going to be do nor rain these years except by my word. And James tells us he prayed for three years and six months that it wouldn't rain and it didn't. And when there was repentance, which we will get to in a few weeks, rain came again as Elijah prayed. My encouragement to all of us is instead of being overwhelmed with the world situation or overwhelmed with... Uh, your own struggles and your own trials is to take God's word and pray it. I think we would all be better off if we maybe took a few minutes off of our news intake, however you do that, and spend more time talking to the one person, God himself, who can take his word and change people and change situations rather than fret and complain and simply report on the news, we take that to God, take God's word and pray it. That's the first thing Elijah does. There's a second thing that Elijah does uh, that models for us, and that is this. Elijah's obedience to God's word brings suffering into his life. Right after he meets with Ahab, verse 2 says, and the word of the Lord came to him, and said, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith. I mean, it seems like Elijah had this, you know, pretty important meeting with King Ahab. You, it would think, you would think that maybe God had other leaders to talk to in the nation of Israel. That, that maybe the movement could gain some steam, right? God commands Elijah, get out of there and go hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. East of the Jordan would again be a very rural, very mountainous, very uh, kind of a wasteland, so to speak. Not a lot of people there. God tells him to hide himself so not to interact with other people. Sends him to a place where you probably wouldn't interact with a lot of people, which is east of the Jordan. Verse 4, God says he's going to provide for him. You shall drink from the brook and I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from, from the brook. Now I understand drinking from the brook. I do not understand eating food that ravens fly in with. 
Would you eat that? I don't think so. But God provides for him there. He's by himself. He's not interacting. We know from the book of James he's praying, of course. But he's in this uh, desolate place, being fed by the ravens, being drinking from the brook Cherith, praying that God would not send rain so that God's discipline would bring um, repentance and revival among God's people. And in verse 7, and after a while the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. And this is what every commentator will, will speak to who writes on 1 Kings, is that the very thing that God prompted Elijah to do by praying Deuteronomy 11 over the nation of Israel, the fact that he went to King Ahab, the fact that he hid himself by the brook Cherith, the ravens are feeding them, the brook is feeding them, Elijah is doing everything that God had commanded him to do. And now he's running out of water. After a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. In other words, Elijah's total obedience to God does not lead to this overwhelming sense of blessing. It actually leads to him suffering. He actually begins to suffer with the rest of God's people in spite of the fact that he believes and is praying to God, yet he is suffering the same fate, so to speak. And even though he has done everything that God had commanded to do, everything that the word of God had told him to do, he now runs out of water. The very obedience that Elijah performs leads to his own suffering. And I think this is something that God can teach us and needs to teach us, is that oftentimes the very thing that God would want us to do the very thing that God would want us to do, the, he's asking us to do from his word, the very uh, application of God's word that we may take may actually not lead to incredible blessing, at least on the surface, may actually lead to significant suffering. And the reality is, for too many of us, even as believers in Jesus Christ, even though we know that Jesus suffered and died in our place, even though we know that Jesus suffered, not so that we would never suffer, but so that when we suffer, we become like Jesus Christ, we have an abhorrence. We have a uh, part of us wants to, to reject any notion that we would have to suffer when we're obeying God. We want God's blessing immediately. And when Elijah and so many other people in the Old and New Testaments, including Jesus Christ, shows us that sometimes you can do exactly what God would want you to do, following God's commands, exactly how he would want us to do, following his direction in all kinds of different ways, and we experience the deprivation of material comforts, we experience the deprivation of friendships, we experience uh, pushback and hostility in all kinds of ways. And too often, I think, we are not prepared to suffer. Particularly if obeying God brings discomfort, we would rather find an easier way. And Elijah shows us that part of what it means to follow God, part of what it means as we uh, read about Elijah in the New Testament, part of what it means to follow Jesus Christ today is we will follow in his footsteps, which means the pattern is first there is suffering, and then, and only then, is there glory. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your word. It challenges us. Thank you for the life of Elijah challenges us to obey and, challenge, and, and suffer, and it challenges us to pray rather than fret and worry. I pray that you would help each of us to take the word of God and pray it over this church, over our fellow believers, but also pray it for our cities and our nation and the world. Help us to take the Lord's Prayer. Help us to take the prayers we read about in the Bible. Help us to take pieces of God's word and pray it over the situation, asking God to do what only he can do. 
And as God begins to answer those prayers and begins to effectuate his word among us, around us, even if that means that we might enter into suffering, I pray that we would be prepared to follow the example of Elijah, but to follow our Savior, Jesus Christ, who showed us the pathway to following him. There is glory in the end, Lord. There is a new life and a new kingdom. Your will and your, 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 your kingdom will come. But between now and then, there will be suffering. And may you help us be prepared to suffer even as we pray and seek your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.